Um, to our first, excuse me for looking at my phone while I'm talking to you. Welcome everyone to our first uh, of a four part series on the 20th uh, anniversary of Channel Islands restoration. For me, it's quite unbelievable that we've been at this for 20 years. And for me, uh, it was an absolute life-changing experience just getting involved and starting the organization. And I'm gonna do something that's really unusual um, for this presentation. I'm gonna talk about myself. I'm gonna give you a little background of me. I'm even gonna show pictures of me. This is something I never do. I'm shy, uh, but I want, uh, to uh, be able to talk to you a little bit about what led me to start CIR, what were the circumstances, what were uh, my motivations and the good luck that I had and the incredible, wonderful people that helped me along the way. Um, it's an inspirational story, if I say so myself, and I, I figured that out because I did a uh, article wrote an article about it in a recent newsletter. So uh, perhaps you saw that. I do know of uh, several people wrote me about it. Um, they liked it, but one person in particular who uh, was in her late 30s said, um, in short, she was very effusive and just said, you've totally inspired me that um, we uh, someone can change careers uh, even a little late in life and go on to uh, do things that are really important and uh, make a difference and are really rewarding. So that's kind of what the first part of this is about. And then I'm going to just talk about Santa Cruz Island. Most of it's about what we did early on in Santa Cruz Island, what it was like out there. It was, it was charmed. It was amazing. I knew that we were experiencing um, something, a real privilege uh, to be out there working uh, to help that island. And now that I look back, I realize, gee, uh, it certainly was. And uh, uh, perhaps you'll see a picture of yourself in there, um, but uh, let's get going. So all about me now, who is this Ken Owen person anyway, and sort of, kind of a play on Douglas Adams. Somebody might get that reference. Um, yeah, there. that's kind of how I look nowadays, in, you know, at my best. And those are some younger pictures of me, which I like a lot better. Um, well, I was born in Ojai, California, and uh, I've lived in Ventura County um, most of my uh, early years, up until I was 15 when my family moved to Santa Barbara. So I've been in Santa Barbara since I was 15, since 1978. So it's been quite some time. But I do remember Ojai, I actually, we moved away uh, when I was four, but um, that scene of downtown Ojai and the arches uh, are still in my memory, even as a four-year-old. Uh, I did have somewhat of a troubled adolescence. That's kind of understating it. I don't want to uh, go into details, but it was uh, tough adjusting. And by my 20s, I was thoroughly confused and did not know which direction I should uh, go in. I had multiple part-time jobs that uh, didn't lead to anything. I didn't like them. Uh, I didn't go to college. I wasn't prepared because of a uh, learning disability to even really enter college yet. Um, but I, um, not but, I should just say that it was a real tough time. I didn't know where I was going. Fortunately, I decided to start pursuing some passions that didn't pay money. Uh, now, my parents would have liked it if I had a paying job because that way I wouldn't be living with them. You know, it's everybody's doing that now, right? You know, a lot of people have had their kids move back in with them or stay with them through their 20s and maybe even older, uh, but it wasn't quite as usual in the 70s. So, uh, but it did give me a chance because I wasn't working full time 
to do a lot of volunteer work. And it's amazing how much uh, that uh, changed my life. So I'm always telling people, volunteer for something, especially young people, but anyone, if you uh, aren't sure what you're doing. And of course, I know so many people who volunteer, you know, uh, especially in retirement, they're busier in retirement than they ever were during their working career. But a lot of young people, um, uh, who I've encountered, I really try to tell them to get involved, go do something that's fun, that's passionate. Uh, don't look at volunteerism as work, look at it as something really cool to get involved with. And then you won't have so many questions, it'll start to come into focus. So I really started my um, volunteer career with the American Red Cross. And um, I did uh, damage assessment. I ran uh, Red Cross shelters and, in disaster areas. I uh, was a Red Cross um, uh, instructor. Uh, I started at marketing, doing newsletters and things like that. I began to learn the nonprofit world and uh, I was a national disaster worker. So I went to, in just one year, only a couple months apart, in 1987, I went to the Caribbean, first Puerto Rico, and then St. Thomas after Hurricane Hugo, which went on to also damage uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, horribly. And then turned around a couple months later and went uh, up to the Bay Area after the Loma Prieta earthquake. And that's the uh, Nimitz Freeway there um, in Oakland. And that's where I was stationed most of my time that I was volunteering up there, teaching damage assessment to hundreds of people. So really honing my uh, instructor, uh, instructing skills. And I uh, got a firsthand look at that freeway while the cars were still smoking in it. Um, just a couple of days after the earthquake, it was horrifying. Um, if you remember that that was supposed to be a two decker two level freeway and it collapsed during the earthquake it was uh, really really horrible um i also learned grant writing i wrote my first grant when i was volunteering with the red cross and guess what it got funded uh i was able um to uh write a grant for uh the vehicle that's in the lower right there um, that uh, was called a um, uh, emergency response vehicle, an IRV, and uh, the Santa Barbara County chapter got its first IRV uh, because I wrote a grant uh, and convinced them that we, uh, the National Red Cross, that we needed it, and with a little help from um, uh, the disaster director. So I did love the Red Cross. It was uh, certainly exciting. It was interesting. It was a lot of work. Um, I had a lot of responsibility. I was given major responsibility to train hundreds of people to run these big shelters uh, in very tough conditions. Um, and I was still just a kid in my 20s and um, with really no education other than in high school. Uh, but I was learning a lot and picking up skills that uh, I still um, possess today. However, it didn't pay any money, of course. Um, it was a volunteer job uh, and it was, I worked at it a lot, I can tell you that. Um, I then got a, um, uh, a friend of mine, Tom Roberts, who went on to become a Santa Barbara City Council member uh, offered me a position at uh, Easy Lift Transportation. That's the paratransit uh, organization here in town that provides rides for uh, elderly and um, disabled people. I uh, did learned all kinds of aspects of nonprofit administration, grant writing. I became its marketing director eventually. Uh, Tom Roberts taught me a huge amount about running a nonprofit. And I really, really uh, gained a huge amount of experience there. Uh, and it was a paying job. It didn't, uh, and it was full time. So um, I stayed there about five years, but I, a friend of mine offered me a partnership 
Um, oh, and I should say, I, I wanted to put that up. It was a desk job. Um, not ex exactly exciting, but that's why I had that graphic there, a desk job. Uh, oh, I just started the whole thing over again. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, let me get us back. Easy lift. Um, at the same time, I was heavily involved with politics. Now, I'm not going to tell you which side of the aisle I was on, okay? But you can probably figure it out. I, I don't like to get into politics with uh, our volunteers because guess what? We attract all kinds of people. But I was a county chairman. I was a state party executive board member. And I was a Santa Barbara City Harbor Commissioner, which is a appointed position for four terms, 16 years. So I did learn a lot about politics and about how to get things done uh, or how hard it is to get things done, <laughs> actually. Um, I, uh, I left Easy Lift though, um, because a friend offered me a partnership in a software company that made a database for lawyers, really exciting. But I was um, uh, learned a lot about uh, software, uh, went to City College to study it uh, for a couple of years, databases, software specialists. I was uh, learned customer service skills and I did sales. But it too was a desk job. It was not inspiring at all. Um, but during that time, I had the um, fortunate um, the fortune to uh, be able to um, meet Steve Junak, the botanist. Uh, Steve is an amazing uh, uh, guy. He's uh, authored and co-authored many books on the Channel Islands uh, about the flora of the Channel Islands. He was the herbarium uh, curator at the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens, and he's my mentor for sure. Um, so I started going on trips with him, and uh, the bottom picture is just a, uh, a trip that I found with Steve in it. That's Santa Barbara Island, but um, uh, I'm not, I wasn't on that trip. But the first trip that I went with Steve on was a spring in Santa Barbara Island. Uh, and uh, uh, most people don't get out there in spring. Uh, it was pretty neat. Um, now, I also kind of fell in love with Santa Cruz Island. I went out there, I had, I had been out there as a young person and as and in my 20s, I won't go into that story. Um, but here I am in my 30s and uh, I uh, was, went out on a trip with Steve Junak to um, uh, explore the island. And Steve's just amazing how he just absolutely blew my mind and inspired me uh, with uh, um, the mo amazing things about plants. He just absolutely turned me on about plants, especially endemic plants, plants that grow only on the Channel Islands or only on Santa Cruz Island and nowhere else in the world. That blew my mind, you know, evolution, and, and right in front of you, speciation from uh, because it's an insular ecosystem. I started eating this stuff up. Now, by day, I was working at um, a software company, but the rest of the time, I was reading everything I could about island ecology and botany and started to take classes um, on the subject. There was uh, on, on one of those trips, on the, the trip that I took. Well, it was the first trip because I went with on several with Steve to Santa Cruz. Um, uh, we were driving around in a Jeep and I was just curious, you know, I, I had a job. I wasn't really, as I told you, that excited about it, but I was just curious, how does somebody get a job working on the Channel Islands? So I asked him that. I said, how did somebody get a job out here? And Steve had taken a liking to me because, you know, he just blew my mind and everything that he showed. And, and I, I, we just hit it off right away. Um, and he took me very seriously. He, um, uh, we had about a 45 minute drive to go to get back to the field station. And in that time, he um, would periodically bring up 
ideas about how somebody who doesn't have a science degree, or for that matter, a degree of any kind, uh, doesn't have any environmental experience. Um, but I was beginning, I was volunteering. Um, how would somebody like me break into biology, as he, as he put it? And I almost felt like I was wasting his time because I wasn't planning on leaving a, a job, a full-time job, to try something that I had really I was just learning about. Um, but he got my attention and I just thought, well, that would be, it would be amazing to work out here and, and do, um, and work in, in biology. But anyway, that, that's not going to happen. I thought, well, there was this thing called the dot-com crash, um, to, in the year 2000. And our company had, uh, Griffin Software had sold to another, uh, legal firm that was everybody was buying up dot coms right and there was a bubble and um, starting in 2000 or so they they bought us and then kind of forgot about us um, continued to pay my salary as I was doing mostly customer service for a dwindling base of customers so I had a lot of time on my hands and a, and a you know halfway decent salary I mean wasn't a lot but uh, enough to live on. Uh, and I could um, sneak away and sneak away, you know, go away for uh, uh, island trips. So I, be I began to really explore islands and I began to study uh, biology. I um, can't tell you how many people, including Steve Junak and Bob Haller and Mary Carroll, and all kinds of other folks at the Botanic Gardens, how they uh, changed my life. I love that institution. I credit them greatly, um, especially Steve, but really everything that they did, all the plant walks that I went on, all the classes that I took. I started volunteering as a teacher's aide uh, for Mary Carroll in her, in her classes. So I really learned a lot. At Santa Barbara City College, I took my first botany course and other uh, horticulture classes, greenhouse classes, uh, and then uh, restoration classes. And it was there that I started talking to other students who were specifically taking these classes to do habitat restoration. And I became aware of that as a science and as a um, uh, uh, a career that people can go into. And I began to really think about it. But again, I was still employed. Uh, but not for long. Um, they, they finally let us go. They basically said, we're not supporting your staff anymore. We're, we're going to drop, drop your company. And I was out of a job. And I could have gone on to a lot of other computer jobs. There were still plenty in Santa Barbara, but I just decided I was gonna take a big risk. I was in my late thirties and I was going to start uh, working in restoration. The person who really helped me the most uh, was Darlene Cheerman. She was uh, president of Santa Barbara Audubon. Yay, Darlene. I don't know if she's on here or not. She lives in Oregon now, but um, she really gave me my first uh, restoration job. And at the same time, Dr. Christine Sanderval out at Coal Oil Point Reserve um, also gave me a, a job. So I had, oh, I'm going to have to say something like 15 hours a, uh, a week at first, and, and that's it. It was very, very thin. Now, fortunately for Santa Barbara, I was only paying like $550 a month on rent on a crummy apartment, but it was cheap. And a Royal Hondo Preserve uh, used to be an avocado ranch and we were working there uh, once a week and I would fill bags of avocados. And folks, I can't tell you how many times I had guacamole for dinner. It was amazing. I dropped a huge amount of weight. 
and I um, worked my butt off. Uh, I'd love to tell you that whole, that story and how uh, it progressed, but I was up at a Royal Hondo every week, and I was at Coil Point every week, and I um, got to grow plants for a restoration site at Coil Point and learned to take out invasive plants at Aurora Hondo. Uh, and both of these uh, incredible women were um, instrumental in that. Um, and then I started to collect islands. Uh, I, I uh, This happened over a long period of time, of course, I'm kind of jumping ahead in a way, but um, uh, you know, my first island was in 1968 when I was five years old. And that was Catalina. And I barely remember that. I remember the casino building and a couple other memories. But um, I started making sure that I got pictures every time I went to these other islands. Um, and so I eventually got all eight. In fact, I'm member number 100 of the all eight club, uh, which was a, a neat distinction. So um, while being out at UCSB and Coal Oil Point, I um, uh, started attending some seminars that Wayne Farron was putting on, if you know who Wayne is, the ecologist. And he, um, after the, uh, we had heard, a friend of mine and I had heard that this guy named Clark Cowan would, would organize quarterly trips to Santa Cruz Island to volunteer. And um, we started attending the seminars because they were, interesting, but at the end of that, we talked to Clark and said, hey, can we get in on this? And he said, sure. So we started um, uh, going out quarterly with Clark and the UCSB um, ecology students. And there on Santa Cruz Island is where I met Duke McPherson, uh, arborist and all around cool guy who eventually uh, I would start CIR with. Uh, there's the three of us passing by each other in the middle of work on Santa Cruz Island. So um, Clark is uh, uh, working with the Park Service now. Uh, he didn't uh, work with us to start CIR, but he uh, did work on some of our projects, which was great because he's also a very talented botanist and um, uh, tree guy, Sawyer, and I uh, like. Checking the time here. I want to uh, probably speed this up a little bit, but here's the UCSB students. Uh, some of these folks I recognize, like George Thompson and Wayne Chapman, who are, um, uh, George works for the city of Goleta now, uh, and Wayne is out at UCSB and runs their nursery. All these folks went on to, to great careers. Uh, it wasn't all hard work. It was fun games to lots of driving out to cool places. And that place was covered with pigs and you could chase down the little ones and they didn't like it, but um, you know, you could get, catch them and uh, take, take their picture. Um, on one of the trips, I started vo um, collecting volunteers. I started signing people at, hey, come on out and volunteer with us. And one person who did was Kate Simons, and she was with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Ventura office and was very impressed by our work. And she asked if we had ever considered grant funding. She wrote three grants uh, uh, for the county of Santa Barbara, a little complicated. Duke and I were just a couple of guys. We didn't have an organization. So um, uh, Kate got the count, someone in the county, David Chang, to agree to um, uh, apply for these, but she wrote the grants, two to her own agency and one to uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They were all funded, $200,000. Suddenly we're pros. We had to form an organization. Uh, we started off with the easiest thing to do, which was uh, LLC. And we called it Channel Islands Restoration, and that was in 2002. And these are the watersheds that we worked on, mostly removing tamarisk and eucalyptus. Give you an idea of a typical trip out there, it'd start real early. Um, we were taking the Park Service boat because it would go out every 
Monday and Friday. So we generally would go out Friday and come back on Monday. So you only had to take two days off of work. Uh, and that worked great for me. Uh, and um, I basically at that point was able to give up my work uh, part-time job and pass it on to other folks at for Darlene and Chris, and this was now my full-time job. Um, boat would arrive at Prisoner's Harbor on transportation day. It was busy, people coming and going. Um, the pier has been redesigned, but um, you still essentially climb a ladder, but not, not as difficult as that. Um, and these are the kinds of trees that we were going after. Now, there were, and to a degree still are, massive forests of eucalyptus out there, but we were mostly going after small ones, like in the upper left-hand corner there, that were spreading out of the original groves. Um, for those who don't know, I don't uh, want to get into it too much, but if you just let them grow, they will completely change the habitat and ruin it for the native animals and the native plants, some of which are unique to the island. But we also took out some larger ones. This whole grove right now, that you see right now, was taken out uh, by us over the course of several trips. And in fact, if you see the line there, it is tied up to a tree. Duke had climbed up that tree, and that's what he would do. And you can see it's leaning into the other trees. Well, you can't just cut that and have it fall into the other trees because that now you've got a problem on your hands. It doesn't fall. So uh, he would get the volunteers to put tension on the rope and pull on the tree as he would cut it. And uh, I have some grainy video to show what that looked like. If I can find my cursor. There we go. Uh, So that was always fun. Uh, so we did get into some bigger ones, even some really giant ones here and there, but most of them were smaller trees that volunteers could cut with a handsaw, and we took out tens of thousands of them. Um, there are other eucalyptus out there that have been there since the 1870s, and they're protected as historic trees. But the ones that have spread out of those groves um, have been removed, and we were uh, among the first people to uh, do a concerted effort to get rid of the smaller ones that were spreading out from the groves. Um, you can see the equipment we use. We had a lot of stuff uh, left over. We chip it and spread the chips. So that was uh, useful. And we also worked on Vinca Major or Periwinkle. God awful plant. Don't plant it anywhere, please, especially near a creek. You'll never get rid of it. It's really hard to get rid of, and we worked on it extensively. Uh, we had all kinds of different people come on, on our trips. We did, uh, I don't know how many did, well over 100 trips to Santa Cruz Island over the course of many years. Um, and um, uh, we brought kids out in 2005. Often it was... Um, adult groups uh, of all ages, and the the uh, uh, gentlemen in the lower right there are from the uh, Los Angeles Conservation Corps, so um, they donated their time to come out and be able to see a cool island, and uh, they were very skilled, and uh, so they were very helpful. We even had some kids from the Los Prietos Boys Camp which was um, a detention facility, but uh, the kids that were uh, on the good list were allowed to come out to Santa Cruz Island and put in their labor. Um, so um, you got to imagine how life-changing that must have been to be detained, but then allowed to come out and be on an island. And uh, all she had to do is put in some physical labor. Um, the labor was pretty intense. Um, a lot of what we also did, though, in addition to working, is that we provided an education program. So we were driving around in these ancient um, uh, surplus military vehicles that worked most of the time. And uh, some of you on here, I know, recognize these, these trucks. 
Uh, I don't know how many they have left now because they've been uh, replacing a lot of them with much newer vehicles. So it's not quite the same. <laughs> but, um, you know, no seat belts required when you're uh, uh, off road. And uh, I, I drove so many of these uh, uh, vehicles with people in there. It was a big responsibility. Uh, and I really learned to drive off road and how not to get anybody hurt. Um, big responsibility to to have a truckload of people that you're taking on uh, sometimes very steep dirt roads. Uh, but also stopping periodically to uh, do an education program. That's me in the lower left with a map of the island telling people where we're going to go, um, the things that we're going to see. Uh, the one on the right there, I'm holding an ironwood uh, leaf. That's uh, one of the groves behind me. We'd always stop in that same location, beautiful endemic manzanitas, and those are endemic trees. So um, I do slideshows at night. Um, and uh, so we had a full on education program that um, uh, people seemed to like. Uh, I got a lot of compliments on it. Um, Life at the field station was just so cool. As I say, we were privileged and we knew it, but I look back at this and go, God, that was wonderful. So we'd all get together as a group and make dinners and, uh, you know, burrito night, spaghetti night and whatever, you know, um, for the three evenings that we were there. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. Another neat thing was the fire pit outside the, um, uh, station. Um, you got uh, Joel Fithy in there and Andrea Adams Morden, uh, Joel's nephew. Um, had a lot of fun with him. You can see me laughing, and that was the same trip. Uh, we were just, uh, but every evening it was around the fire um, if it wasn't raining. And um, we uh, had a, a hell of a time. It was really, really great. It was educational. It was amazing because researchers who would be out there working on other projects would, would come out to the fire too. And we got to hear about all of what they were doing. Skunk researchers, I got to hold a baby skunk once and uh, actually several times, uh, fox researchers and all kinds of geologists. And it just, it was amazing the, the kinds of people that we got to talk to and we just had a lot of fun. And uh, did I mention Andrea Adams Morden? I don't think I did. She often attends her webinar, so maybe she's here. There, there she is beaming. Smiling. Um, okay, so that's really kind of encapsulates Santa Cruz Island for the first few years. Uh, I'll come back to it uh, in a later presentation at another time. But um, one of the next projects that we took on were several on Santa Rosa Island. We um, were hired by the county's agricultural commissioner to eradicate a particular thistle, the Beaumont thistle, um, which uh, is an agricultural pest. And so the county by law um, uh, needs to control agricultural pests. So they were able to get a grant for us to go out to the one place in Santa Barbara County that Beaumont thistle grew, and that's on Santa Rosa Island. That's Santa Cruz Island in the background, by the way. So. Um, we did find quite a few specimens of it, and we made probably 12, 10 to 12 trips out there, and we quit finding it. And um, uh, people have gone back every year since, uh, but they stopped like four years ago or something because they can't find it anymore. We eradicated it. It's, it's the only weed that I know of that we ever eradicated anywhere completely. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to get rid of weeds. I mean, we can eradicate something from an area, but there's always something beyond the next hill. But on uh, Santa Rosa, we got rid of this one thistle. Um, we, had, we put up fencing uh, because there were deer and elk out there that had been introduced. They're gone now, so then we took out the fencing. Um, we planted plants all over the place. We worked in the nursery later on. That's the mainland in the background there, Gaviota Coast. Pulled up ice plant. Uh, and then at the same time, we were working on the mainland as well. We um, 
again with the county agricultural commissioner uh, office um, and uh, David Chang, who had uh, helped us get our original grant that Kate Simons had wrote, uh, wanted to eradicate Arundo Donax, the giant reed, the bamboo-like plant that chokes creeks and takes over and drives out the native life. And um, he wanted to uh, remove it from Carpinteria Creek, so he got a grant. And over uh, two years, uh, Duke and I, with the help of the California Conservation Corps, eradicated the Arundo. So the Arundo in, the, in this picture is the light colored plant. You can see it up in the top right ish there. Uh, but most of it's along the creek bank, mostly on the right side of the creek, but you can see a little on the left. It's all that light colored bamboo looking stuff. And this is how it looked after we had uh, removed the Arundo. So um, Carpinteria Creek is not 100% Arundo free. Um, and, uh, but nobody anywhere wants to ever get back to the way it was. It was infested for three miles with these giant stands. They can get up to 30 feet plus tall. They can grow an inch a day. And it was a real, um, uh, challenge, but, um, there's still some there and, um, we are always interested in looking for funding to go back. It's hard to find funding for maintenance but um and it's um the the property is owned by all the homeowners along the um creek so it's not like you have like what we do nowadays currently in uh, santa clara river we're working with the nature conservancy on their property and uh, they are going to make sure that it stays gone that it gets eradicated but we'll be back. We and we have gone back and retreated it. It just uh, is a really tough weed to eradicate from three miles. Uh, but it does look more like this now rather than that. And I, if you can see, that's a railroad bridge that's elevated, and some of those stalks are higher than that railroad bridge. These are giant, giant plants. Okay, we did the same kind of thing uh, um, in Refugio Creek, uh, and we did it at Lookout Park on the left. That's in Summerlin. You can see the hillside below Lookout Park. You couldn't look out from Lookout Park because there was too much Arundo in the way. And then that's the after picture in the lower right with coastal bluff scrub plants. Those are native plants that we uh, uh, planted in there, put in irrigation and uh, they they took off. So it's uh, you can look out from Lookout Park now. Um, I told you that we had brought kids out as early as 2005, but um, by 2007, we were taking out literally thousands of kids from at-risk um, communities for the most part um, and uh, working in the classroom ahead of time and uh, doing a wonderful environmental education program. We still work with youth every year, uh, but uh, starting in 2007, we got a series of grants uh, and just took out like the entire fourth grade class of Cesar Chavez Elementary from Oxnard. Um, as I said, we work with them in the class ahead of time. And this is the kind of thing they were experiencing. A lot of these kids had never ever been on a boat or even visited a national park. And it's unbelievable, but I've heard this over and over and over again, even here in Santa Barbara, some of the kids had never been to the beach, uh, had no connection with the ocean. And um, one day I can distinctly remember humpbacks breaching over and over again in front of us in the boat, the Island Packers boat is what we were taking for this trip, um, or these trips, uh, stopped. And we just saw these whales come completely out of the water over and over again. It's the best, um, closest uh, view I've had of breaching whales. And these kids freaked out, squealing with delight. It was so gratifying. I just felt like I was changing people's lives. 
uh, and I guess I was. Um, they love pulling up ice plant. That's Anna Kappa Island. Uh, we actually did that a little bit later on. I'm really only covering the first five years uh, of our work, but um, that's the latest statistic. Um, I think it was over 2,000 kids um, and then uh, 368 adults that went along with them. So it was a lot of people, a lot of grant money, a lot of hard work, but a lot of happy kids. And they loved this one's uh, planting after we had taken the ice plant out. So for next time, stay tuned. I will talk about the next uh, phase of the work that we did on Santa Cruz Island and uh, Santa Rosa and Atacapa and uh, the mainland and various other places. I'd love to tell you about some of those stories. A lot of interesting stuff that we took on that you probably don't know about some of these projects. Each one of those uh, uh, names that you see there, other than property line, uh, are places that we worked. We worked in all of these uh, locations. Um, uh, during this uh, uh, second uh, project that we got, another round of grant funding. So that's my presentation for you. And uh, my gosh, I said it was going to be 45 minutes long, and somehow I managed to keep it on time. So, but it's only five years. We got 15 more years to talk about. I hope you come back and hear about some of the other neat stuff that we've been involved with uh, because we're very proud of our work. And uh, we'd love to tell you about it. So we can take some questions uh, now. Let me uh, stop sharing. And uh, let's see, how do you want to handle this, Maury? Do you have audio? I do have audio. OK, do we just um, have you uh, been following the chat, and, or do we want to? Uh, can people raise their hands and ask questions? Um, I can let people talk or they can submit questions in the uh, Q&A. Why don't, why don't we have people uh, chat? Let's let's hear from some of these folks because some of them may have been on these trips. So use the, uh, the gestures if you know how to do that in um, Zoom and you can raise your hand like that. And how will I know if they're doing that? Uh, let me see if I can bring up the chat. I, we haven't done this before. Okay. Um, if you're if you're interested in uh, asking a question, you can raise your hand, and I'll uh, allow you to speak on the uh, webinar. Okay. Ah. Okay, Paige Hiller Adams, our former volunteer coordinator. Uh, go ahead. I don't hear you, Paige. Are you muted? Hmm, I can't hear her, Maury. I cannot hear her either. Oh, darn. Put it in the. Uh, Let's see. You have one in here. Ken, this history and your story are awesome. Thank you. Looking forward to the next installment. Thank you, Paige. But uh, yeah, I don't know uh, why. Let me see. Uh, we can't hear you now. OK, Tom and Jane, who I'm going to be seeing in a few months out on San Miguel. Go ahead. How are you guys doing? Great, good, great show. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, very interesting to see how it all came about. You know, I'm kind of curious, how did, how does ice plant, uh, and, uh, uh, Vinca get out to the islands? Um, so on Anacapa Island, uh, where we done most of our, uh, eradication of ice plant, um, it, it was planted for erosion control. And uh, I have some amazing pictures from the late 70s that the Park Service took of a little bit of ice plant, some nice blue phacelia, 
and then uh, a, a yellow native uh, flower of some kind, I forgot what it is, all sort of mixed together and a red flowered ice plant. So red, blue, yellow. And then 11 years later, it's all red. It's just total ice plant completely covered. It took it over and eradicated all the natives in that area. So they, they um, after they built a Coast Guard station out there, um, the Coast Guard built a station out there, they uh, uh, were having trouble with uh, erosion. So that's why they planted it. And most people do plant ice plant for that reason. Some people like it, but most of the time, like, Caltrans has planted it along the freeways. Now they're taking it out and replacing it because ice plant actually tends to cause slope failure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get a, a, a slope really soaked after many, many rains, if that's still possible in California, um, the ice plant will get very heavy and full of water and, the, and it's really not that deep rooted. And uh, the, the slopes can just fail. So um there's a lot of different plants that are a lot more effective um than ice plant at uh, that are deeper rooted that um will control erosion mm -hmm. how about the vinca well it's an ornamental um so that would have been planted around the ranch uh at santa cruz island and um uh, it, uh, especially if it's anywhere near the creek, just a little piece can break off and that's all it needs to do. It's a rhizomatous plant with underground stems and it'll um, uh, spread very easily. And um, it's it never got eradicated as far as I know. Um, the uh, former ranch manager said, oh, I can still find vinca. And I said, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it was it was all over the place in giant meadows. And, uh, you know, uh, I swear we eradicated 99% of it, but uh, so what, you know, 1% it'll, it'll come back. Uh, but, you know, th there were large areas that it was completely blanketing. And uh, um, it was interesting to come back and see native plants coming back in areas where we had taken out these huge mats of it. Mm -hmm. Good to hear, uh, hear you guys and see you. See you later. Uh, see you soon. Uh, any other questions? Let's see. Uh, Polly Nelson. Uh, you're muted, Polly. Okay, Polly, well, you're, you're still muted, so you're going to have to figure out how to unmute. I'll go into the question and answers. Uh, John uh, Hankins, uh, how did you take out a rundo? Did you use herbicides? Next question. Um, <laughs> um, there's two ways to eradicate a rundo. Um, you can reconstruct an entire creek uh, by taking a... Uh, uh, skip loaders and bulldozers to it. That's been done in a lot of places where they just start over again and just recreate the creek. Um, because uh, every other method of non-chemical um, uh, control has been ineffective. I've never heard of another method or we would use it. So uh, yes, we've used uh, various chemicals on it um, under, usually under permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, we are licensed to uh, use uh, a formulation around uh, uh, rivers, like on the Santa Clara River and creeks, formulations that uh, don't uh, harm uh, amphibians, frogs, and, and, and fish. Um, because we work around red-legged frogs, arroyo toad, uh, steelhead, all endangered species. And we do this with consultation and um, uh, permission from the federal government, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, but you can, uh, if you have a small infestation, just literally dig it all up with a skip loader and then come back, put in riprap, rocks and refill it with soil and then plant it. But you can't do that on three miles of creek like we had in Refugio and Carpinteria and uh, on the Santa Clara River. 
page. I just wondered how that aspect was handled because you helped so many children through those work trips. Uh, okay, sounds like I answered the question then. Um, any other questions? She, she, she was asking about the uh, liability for the trip skin. Oh, the liability. Oh yes, you're right. Thank you. Um, yeah, that um, uh, is uh, accomplished by uh, buying lots and lots and lots of insurance and being very, very, very careful. Um, the um, uh, good thing when working from our standpoint, from a liability standpoint, is when we work with Channel Islands National Park, um, they assume liability. The federal government assumes liability. It doesn't mean that somebody won't sue us if their child gets hurt, uh, but um, they uh, sign up as volunteers for the park. Uh, their parents sign a, a, um, a, a um, application for them to be volunteers and then the parents sign a waiver. But that doesn't necessarily protect you. You just have to be very, very careful. It's never um, easy to um, uh, work with children. You know, it's you're always putting you're always putting yourself at risk of being sued if anything goes wrong. So you just got to make sure nothing goes wrong. And um, so far, so good. Uh, Polly, uh, I think I saw your hand up again. So really a labor of love on your part. You bet, Paige, and you you set up a lot of these trips. So did anybody else uh, want to raise their hand? I uh, saw Polly, their little message come up. Um, let me go into the, so what do we got? Are we done? Any other questions, folks? We got five minutes. There's 32 of you left. <laughs> okay, Tom and Jane again. I see you raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Unmute and go ahead. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'm unmuted. Um, I just wanted to ask if uh, you have any thoughts about going to San Clemente Island. Any? Do you, <laughs> do you see any chance of, of organizing a volunteer trip out there? Uh, eventually, it it uh, costs us. Um, they don't um, uh, have a contract money for us right now. We've been able to finagle contracts out of them in the past to uh, remove ice plant and fennel. Um, uh, but uh, there's more ice plant, and uh, I've been told by the uh, environmental person um, that if we wanted to volunteer our time, we could do it. It's logistically extremely complicated. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's very costly. It, it costs us a lot of money to, to coordinate a trip like that. You have to get Navy passes for everybody, background checks. Um, Paige can tell you all about this. It's just an incredibly complicated process. Uh, and if we don't have a contract, we um, it comes out of our coffers. Uh, I uh, somebody came up to me and the other day, the other month, and said, uh, "I'm an all sevener." And I said, "You mean an all eighter?" And she says, "No, I've only got seven islands." And I said, <laughs> "Oh, you don't have San Clemente, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, do something about it." <laughs> <You know? laughs> So uh, it was, um, uh, you know, I know how much people want to go to San Clemente and we have taken a lot of people there. We uh, there's the, the all eight list grew considerably because of our projects on San Nicolas and San Clemente. Um, I, um, uh, you know, have toyed with the idea of talking to Brian Munson uh, and the Navy and asking if it would be copacetic to charge for a trip like that so that we could de defray our costs. 
uh, and um, it, it may or may not be that might just seem like so we're trying to make money. I don't, you know, I'd like I'd like to break even and take people out there, but it it, it would cost us many thousands of dollars a trip uh, because uh, we have to send a staff person or two. Um, there's commute time, uh, and then there's just office time, huge amounts of paperwork. And um, the logistics, the back and forth is just amazing. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Let's see. What do we have in the chat? What caused the most sleepless nights at this stage of CIR? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I well, um, you know what it was? I only got paid when I was actually doing restoration. I didn't get paid for doing all the administration. So I needed to um, take GPS points and create GPS maps. I needed to uh, do all the volunteer coordination uh, and uh, lots of other administrative stuff. As time went on, um, we um, became a, a nonprofit organization and eventually uh, worked it out so I could be on salary. But for the first few years working for CIR, every year my pay went down because my office time went up and my field time went down. So that was kind of crummy. Uh, but really everything about working on Santa Cruz Island was fabulous. Um, we were really lucky. We were just really privileged. And um, uh, I, I love that place. It's, it's an incredible place. And um, uh, we did uh, have um, a kid get an, have an appendicitis one evening. Two o'clock in the morning, knock on my door. And um, the trip leaders um said that he's a hypochondriac and he always gets sick when he gets on the island you know i don't know that we should call a helicopter and i talked to him and he said he's doubled over and he's i'm in pain i gotta get off this island i'm like that's good enough for me and um so in the middle of the night you know i'm calling in a helicopter and he's take taken to the hospital and he was having an appendicitis he would have died if we had likely if we hadn't evacuated him we had another situation where somebody went into a diabetic coma and they sent helicopters, but they had to turn around because of the fog. Uh, but we had we had a doctor on the line, and we uh, were able to revive him by uh, um, getting sugar in his in his uh, lip because he was totally unconscious. And eventually, he became conscious and was able to drink his glucose. And by the next day, he was fine. Um, Another person was evac, evac from uh, Santa Rosa Island who had a seizure and was discovering they had a brain tumor. Uh, so those were tricky moments. Um, so it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't all uh, fun and games. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, but th those were successful, and and uh, I. I credit some of my uh, work with the Red Cross for being, uh, you know, ready and able to deal with emergencies and things like that. Um, thank you, uh, Susie. Thanks for the early view. Okay. Um, anybody else got anything for me tonight? I'm I'm having fun uh, chatting with you. We our webinars are we uh, are so um, large that. Um, we don't. Uh, okay, Chris Larson, go, go ahead and unmute. Uh, it says you raised your hand. There you are. Go ahead and unmute. There you are. Hello? I can barely hear you, Chris, but you're in there. You might remember me from a Revea Hedo trip. Sorry, say that again. Remember that I was on the Revilla Hejero trip in Mexico with you a few years ago. Ah, uh, the Revilla Hejeros, yes. Uh, yeah, that was, that's quite an archipelago. That's, uh, yeah. 
I think they just had a hurricane. Kay just went over them. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, um, talking about amazing place. Go ahead. Well, I'm an all aider, but uh, San Nicholas was thanks to you. Uh, but uh, San Clemente Island is not thanks to you. Believe it or not, I had a friend of a friend who worked for the Navy and she finagled getting me on for a whole weekend. Nice. So that was uh, quite a quite a deal. We toured the whole island. <laughs> that was about five, six years ago. Yeah, well, when we worked there, we worked mostly in the northern to central part. So we didn't get very far, but um, uh, Steve Juniak led a trip for the Jepson Herbarium to San Clemente Island, and we got down into Shoba, the shore bombardment area. Not, I mean, past the gate, not down right where the ordnance lands, but on the bluff above where shells get shot from ships and land on targets. So uh, that I saw a good part of the the island on that trip, and every single island endemic, I think everyone were close to it. Um, which I put on iNaturalist. It's uh, uh, amazing. Steve was just so fun to be with. And um, uh, these trips, you know, Chris, you'll know, I mean, everybody who comes on these trips uh, tend to just be the coolest people. Uh, I'm not just talking about our trips, but the Jepson Herbarium, that's where I met uh, Tom and Jane. Um, I don't know which one that was. Was that San Nicholas, guys? Steve and I were asking about that. Uh, talking about that the other day. I don't remember exactly where we met, but you've come on a lot of our trips too. Um, Tom and Jane actually went to Anacapa, stayed over, did work there, and then went to Scorpion on the same, uh, you know, a couple of days later and stayed there and did some volunteer work. So they worked on two islands on one trip. They're from the Bay Area. Um, but uh, all the people that are on these trips are just so cool they're they're interesting they all got interesting life stories and uh they're all enthusiastic about uh saving nature and uh ah san nicholas yes well uh, that was another trip that steve took us on uh time and that's where we met tom and jane uh what's that say uh um maury in the question and answer let's see or the chat. Um, oh, I see. My chat is covered by my question and answers. Were you bumping shoulders with Tanya Outwater while she studied geology out there at this time? No, this was um, a long time after she studied geology out there, but uh, I got to know Tanya very well. And we did have a trip to Santa Cruz to do just geology once. And we went looking for the Poway conglomerate. And we found the two places that Tom Dibley had mapped Poway conglomerate. Now, most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And we'd have to do a whole other uh, presentation on what the Poway conglomerate is. But in short, it's a rock that is found down in the San Diego area and also on Santa Cruz and also on Santa Rosa. And it is one of the indications that um, the transverse ranges block had, has rotated 110 degrees and moved north uh, in relation to North America. Uh, and uh, these rocks were originally, came from volcanoes in Sonora and then, um, uh, eventually ended up on the, the coast and became cobbles. And they're very distinctive. They're, they're maroon and speckled. And Linda Lauren, who uh, uh, has been, you know, was the director of the UC Reserve out there for many years, went along with Tanya and I on, on these trips. And we went up this tiny little slot canyon. And just when we were ready to give up, we found the Poway conglomerate. And uh, it was just a a, a distinct purple layer with cobbles in it, and everything else was uh, more more clay-like. And also, you can see it um, at Christie Beach if you had 
south uh, from Christie Beach, uh, there's a, a canyon. I forgot what it's called, but Poway Conglomerate is really easy to get to there. Uh, so we went to both of them. But yeah, that's a neat story. Um, any other questions? How, uh, how has the Montrose money run out? I don't know. I think it was close. Um, but I don't actually have an answer to that question. What was one of the most important or valuable lessons you learned about nonprofit management in the er early years of starting Channel Islands Restoration with Duke? Um, uh, insurance, liability, uh, human resources, uh, uh, safety, um, uh, pesticide application. <laughs> safety. Um, there is so much bureaucracy involved with running a company and nonprofits are incorporated. We are a company. We just don't have shareholders who take profits and neither do we. We get just paid a salary. Um, how to try to keep an even amount of money coming in every year so you can predict how you're going to pay people and keep them and hold them. It, it was extremely difficult at first because we'd have a busy season in the winter, spring, and then again in the fall, but not in the summer. And um, so people like Kevin Thompson, who was uh, worked with us for like 15 years, and uh, he's now the director of the Parks Department in Oxnard, uh, would have to go take another job, but he'd, he'd come back. And a lot of people were like that. They'd come back and work with us, uh, but it it's not was never easy for them. And we uh, money was so short, we could never really pay people what they were worth. And we had no benefits, but that's all changed. And, and we, um, um, we, we, we pay well, and we, uh, for full-time employment, you would get insurance and all that. You know, medical insurance and that kind of thing. So we we grew up, uh, but it took a long time to reach that spot where we had enough work coming in every year, and it's it's still unpredictable. You know, we we do fundraising, and um, that's uh, one of the things that we're going to do at the uh, um, starting in November is ask you for money because that's the one thing that's fairly predictable. Uh, is that uh, we'll we'll get in our, around 10% of our budget, uh, which is a small percentage, but it's fairly regular every year from donations. We'd like that to be 25%. The rest of it's contracts. It's like the Nature Conservancy hiring us or grants from the Fish and Wildlife Service or something like that. Uh, okay. There's 22 of you left. I finally looking uh, at some of these chat questions and thank you for all the uh, neat uh, comments, people. All right, that's, that's what mostly it is. Okay, I see John was in there, John Knapp. Uh, okay. Um, all right, um, last chance to ask a question or make a comment, say hi. So with that, I will thank the uh, 20 of you who are left <laughs> on, who stuck around for the, to the bitter end. We're, we're over time uh, here, but that was fun. I, I'm glad that uh, you guys enjoyed the presentation. Thanks for joining us. And um, we'll, uh, we'll have another one for you soon. Thank you, Kate. Take care, everyone.